is so organized and uh, has this phenomenal ability to inspire people. And I thought, you yeah, know, he he probably ought to be president of the United States or something. I thought, no, 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 he really shouldn't be leader of the free world. He he ought to be emperor of the universe <laughs> because he could keep the trains running on time and then remind us all about the joy of life. Hi, I'm Katerina Pena. And I'm Kevin Papps. My name is Colin Metcalf. Hi, my name is Colby Leppard. Hi, my name is Katie Moss. And my name is Lena Oshinsky. Hi, I'm Mark Nelson. Hi, I'm Koshik. Hi, and I'm Alec. Hi, my name is Emily Broman. The one quality that describes David Phelps is probably servitude. Um, his ability, or not ability really, but his want to serve individuals and keeping that humility at the same time. David is the most intentional, thoughtful person that I've ever met in my entire life. He's such a fantastic leader. Everything that he does, everything that he touches has this aura of awesome around it, and it's all because of the type of person that he is. So David just takes any adversity that happens to him and converts it into something that can help other people. What we've noticed in our undergraduate studies with David Phelps is that he's involved in numerous activities on campus. First of all, he's he started Tide Talks, he started Unlocked, he's managed to study internationally. He's even managed to do all this while he's an undergraduate student in civil engineering. But we realized that there's no way that he can possibly do all these things at the exact same time. So we have done our research and writing our thesis statement on the fact that David Phelps is a super superhero. Hero. David Phelps is a truly unique individual. A blend of energy, passion, motivation, a desire to change the world in a way for the better in everything he does that I confidently can say I have never encountered in another individual on this planet in such force. He's taught me what it means to dedicate yourself entirely and selflessly to a cause rather than just committing yourself to a personal goal or achievement. Uh, and the lessons he's taught me have been far more than just those few. And I know for every lesson that he's taught me, there are at least a hundred more that I simply did not have time to absorb. I've had the privilege of growing with David over the past four years. And it's so difficult to not say everything I want to say about how wonderful and awesome David is. But I think first and foremost, David is thoughtfully uplifting. David is one of those leaders that you really feel a connection to you in terms of he pulls you up to be better without feeling like he's dominating you. He is not only a man of ideas, but what impresses me most is that he is a man of action and he is a man of humility. Not many uh, people who cross this campus can embody all three of those qualities, but David Phelps certainly does. It is my honor to introduce David Phelps. We are honored to introduce David the Man Phelps. It is my honor to introduce David Phelps. It is our honor to introduce David Phelps. And it is my honor, based on all of that, to introduce David Phelps. It is my great honor to introduce to you David Phelps. cubic feet, and it just wasn't enough to contain my flailing 10-year-old body. <laughs> Needless to say, road trips in the Phelps household were a little bit memorable. <laughs> I would get bored in the back. My parents were in the front, my sister would be in the middle, and I'd be way back here. I had a full big seat to myself that I'd be strapped in. I remember we were taking a road trip, we were in Minnesota at the time, I think, or Kentucky, driving to Louisiana, and we were about 30 minutes in, I just had enough. We had tried arts and crafts in the back. We had tried food, which worked for a little bit. Uh, we tried writing things, we tried videos, and eventually I just grabbed my seatbelt and said, I am so bored right now! Did not end well. 
But I want that energy and that kind of framework to guide what we're talking about. Uh, again, my name is David Phelps. Uh, I'm going to talk about the perception of teachers and educational inequity. And here we go. So imagine that, like, seven, eight-year-old kid who's got lots of energy, enters elementary school, has this teacher named Miss Bauer. She was phenomenal. I had her for first, second, part of third, and fourth grade. She saw it was a little bit insane, but she saw potential. She knew that she could take this kind of crazy kid somehow and mold him and frame him to something that was productive. And so Miss Bauer designed this box tops for education project where I collected lots of box tops from different uh, teachers in the room, or teacher in the school, 10 cents a box top. I think we raised like $4.30. Um, but it was some way to use my energy. We had this big yellow bar chart. It was fantastic. Moved to middle school, and that is the most focused I've ever been since. <laughs> it's me behind a drum set at my first gig. I was in the jazz band at East Harden Middle School. And it was a chance to just beat things for hours and hopefully stay in rhythm. And I loved it. And then I realized that when I came to college, I was good at math and science, so I did engineering like you're supposed to do, and it didn't click. There was something about it that was missing. And I began to reflect on who had had the most impact throughout my life other than my parents. And everyone has to do with my teachers. And so I thought maybe I should give this a shot. Maybe I could be good at this. And so I spent a summer in New Orleans at a program called Breakthrough Collaborative, teaching physics to eighth graders. You can see us there working on Bernoulli Principle and Fluid Flow. It was great. And then last summer I had the chance to go to Brooklyn, New York, and teach uh, sixth and seventh grade uh, creative math problem solving. Uh, here, as you see, we're having a grand old time. That is a fan that blows up mattresses normally, but in this instance, it was used to teach binary code. We used the ones and zeros on the off, on and off switch and compared it to ones and zeros printing on and off numbers, and we're able to creatively kind of get to binary code in an exciting way. So I realized maybe this is something I could actually do. That was a great chance to use math and science and energy and understanding and care for kids in a collective way. And then there's great Unlock members in here. Uh, Unlock is an organization uh, that started this year that I helped launch that focuses on educational issues in our local community. So it's with that background that I want to discuss my revolution. There are two keys to this revolution. One is on you as an audience, and one is on me and the rest of us going into education. The first, very simply, is to revolutionize the way we think and speak about teachers. The second, on me in the education world, is to stop doing things the way we've always done them for 50 years. Hopefully that'll make more sense in 12 minutes, or maybe 10 now. Okay, so uh, Dr. Roland Fryer is my uh, man researcher crush, to be real honest. He teaches at Harvard, and I have this uh, kind of hypothetical scenario where it's he and I in Starbucks paying overpriced coffee, and we're discussing educational policy. The lights are dim. There's a guitarist in the background. It's snowing outside because we're in Boston, and it's just a beautiful evening. <laughs> and so last summer, I decided to live this fantasy. I was in Boston for a few days. I got to go to Harvard's campus, and I found his office on the fourth floor. So I walk into this building. I go to this first floor. They don't have an appointment. Go to the second floor. <laughs> The elevator takes me to the third floor, and I get off on the fourth floor, and you have to have a special swipe key to get into Dr. Fryer's office. That's how legit this man is. <laughs> so he does research on educational inequity and uh, economies, and he did this study where he looked at eight to 12 month olds, and he found that regardless of race, of income, of background, of gender, that an eight to 12 month old children have the exact same potential have the same. There's no difference in their cognitive ability and their ability to interact with each other and the way they physically move. So 8 to 12 months old, we all have the exact same potential. But yet somehow decades down the line, things look very different. Remember this as we engage with these topics. Now some context for me. I'm a white, straight, Protestant male, so I understand these discussions of race and gender will come from my own perspective. I'm not ashamed of that, but I recognize it, and so the things that I'm discussing are colored by that reality, um, and I'll do my best to be honest and humble in this, but know that I'll probably get something wrong. Context for education policy, real quickly. Uh, so the Alabama Slave Codes in 1833 basically made it super illegal to teach slaves how to read and write. It was a $200,000 fine in today's dollars for a slave to know how to read and write. A few years later, 1896, we had Plessy versus Ferguson, which established separate but equal schools. Separate but equal schools. 1954, we had the revolutionary Brown versus Board of Education, which changed everything. Now we have a beautifully equitable system where all the children can go together and learn at the exact same rate. 
Brown First Board of Education uh, actually started in New Orleans with some uh, public train situations and we got to the Supreme Court and now everything is awesome, except it's not. <laughs> Today's schools are still separate and still unequal. Uh, for those of you that saw the Atlantic article that released last week, it was a big buzz on Facebook. Uh, for those that actually read the whole thing, it was kind of long. Uh, we understand in Tuscaloosa, we have a history, even in the last few years, of a resegregated school system. There are lots of conflicting parties, there's lots of perspectives. The basic question came down to, are we willing to sacrifice uh, wealthy, generally white families to have the potential of an integrated school system? There's this tension between, do we want what's best for those that already have great things, or do we want to actually try something different? I know there's lots of stances on the issue, but I'm here to say, it's not just minorities that are hurt by segregation. If we continue to say well, we're going to lose rich families if we do this, then we're going to continue to lose rich families if we do this. We must change the things, the things we think about. Yes, we may lose a few people if we integrate our schools truly, but then generations down the line, we'll see the impacts. We can't have short-sighted policy that impacts generations and fails them continuously. But it's not a Tuscaloosa issue. It's not a Southern issue, it is a national issue. There's this big research out of UCLA, the Civil Rights Project, that tried to find the most segregated school system in the nation. It wasn't Tuscaloosa, it wasn't in the South. It was in the beautiful city of diversity, New York City, is the most segregated school system in our nation. I'll be moving there in the fall to start teaching, and uh, I'll live in Brooklyn, but in the Bronx, there is no public school that has more than 10% white enrollment. It's not just Tuscaloosa, it's a national issue. Let's check out some statistics. You'll see the top African Americans, 74% uh, of African Americans go to school where the majority of the students at their school are minorities. For Latinos, it's 79%, where the majority of students at their schools are minorities. It's literally apartheid, apartheid schooling. We resegregate. And this has impacts. We're separate, which means we're not equal. These are the actual test scores. The blue bar is uh, white students. The other two bars, orange is black and green is Hispanic, consistently across the board in every city throughout our nation. White students continue to score above black and Hispanics and Latinos. Is that because they have different potential eight to 12 months, or is there something actually wrong with our system? Think about Dr. Fryer. And in the last few months, I began to discover something. Um, so the achievement gap we somewhat know about, it's this gap in achievement based on race and income, uh, some call it the opportunity gap if you're trying to be hipster. But there's a discipline gap that might be even more appalling. If you look, uh, black students make up 18% of our U.S. public school population. So about one-fifth. I'm teaching math next year. I think that's right. Um, but you look at suspensions and expulsions, it's dramatically more for black students. And research continues to show there's no actual difference in the way black, and black students behave. So why do they continue to get all the suspensions and expulsions? Maybe it's the way we're coding black students, especially black males. The next slide is more indicative. In special ed classes, 21% of the students are black. But look at the physically restrained students within sped classes, 44%. 44% of our special ed students are black, or 44% of our special ed students that are getting restrained are black. They'll have chains on their wrists, maybe. They'll be locked into a chair. Does that not echo of slavery? The way we perceive students is the way they'll perceive themselves. This has to be a conscious choice to stop assuming, well, black poor kids can't achieve. I'll end with a school that's proving that is not true. And in fact, black students and minority students and low-income students can achieve better than any of us probably did. But we have to stop perceiving them as unequal and perceiving them with lower expectations and perceiving them as dangerous and criminal. This is another gap, uh, but it's not the right one. <laughs> Nationally, we're not doing too great on international tests. Are testing the best way to measure students? No, but it's an important uh, point. And you'll see at the bottom, what about creativity and problem solving? We're America, we're innovative, we create lots of inventions, so we're probably pretty good at that. Uh, well, PISA, which is an international metric of different uh, countries, decided to, do, to test that in lots of developing countries. And America did not rank first or second or third or 10th or 11th or 12th. We we're somewhere in the low teens. So even the things we think we're best at, our school system continues to struggle with. This is not a perception issue, it's a reality issue. We must do something about it. But it gets worse. It'll get better real quick. Uh, so somewhere in the middle here, there's about 20 sticky notes. Look under your chair, see if you can find a sticky note. If you do, pull it out. 
Beautiful. You have a sticky note. Uh, President of Tide Talks, Kevin Pass, will give you a pin. But before he does that, here's your instructions. If you have a sticky note, you have 20 seconds to write the most impactful teacher you had, kindergarten through, twith, to, through 12th grade, and the uh, adjective that best describes them. Your most impactful key, teacher, K-12, and one adjective that describes them. As soon as you finish, I want you to put them on the floor right here on the ground. All right, 30 seconds, right quickly. If you need a pin, just raise your hand. Bring it yourself. Physically stand up and bring it to the front of the room. 30 seconds. Here we go. There's one. Beautiful. Keep it going. Right quickly. Just put them right here. Thank you. Beautiful work. 20 seconds. You're a slow rider. Improve. <laughs> 10. Keep the pin. I guess that's okay. Tide Talks has coasters now. That's cool. Five. Four. Oh, you got one. Yes. Three. Two. Get your seat. One. Beautiful. These are teachers that change lives. This is what we think in the room when we think of teachers. Right? We have uh, a coach that was impassionate. We have John Travers who was stimulating. We have uh, Frizzle who was awesome. That's fictional but still cool. <laughs> All right? Remember this when we look at this research. My junior year, I had the chance to look at how the teaching profession is perceived from some of the top undergrads on campus. So I had conversations with about 15 undergrads. Uh, they were all had super uh, high GPAs, three and a half plus, which I would love to have. Uh, diverse backgrounds and interests. These are some of the top students all in the Honors College. And these are actual quotes from things they said. These are not bad people. These are just the things that they said in the interview. And it's important to understand what's happening. Chloe says, I just don't think people view teaching as a profession for smart people. Stephen said, once you're a teacher, people don't see anything beyond that. And the one that hit me the hardest and became the title for this talk, Lindsay said, Lindsay was considering going into education. These are all fake names, by the way. Lindsay was going into education in her early college career. She said, I've heard people say, you're so smart. Why would you waste your talent becoming a teacher? So we started here with teachers we know have changed our lives. Yet somehow we end here with teachers are a waste of talent. You must revolutionize the way you speak and think about teachers because it's this that prevents some of our top undergrads going into teaching and those that do it, do it at the cost of how they're perceived. Why does this happen? I mentioned a little bit. But what if this perception goes a little deeper? What if teaching is perceived as a woman's job? 76% of our teachers are women. Would it be different if 76% were men? Be careful we don't color our conversations with assumptions that aren't true. Now for some hope. Uh, Jeffrey Canada is one of my uh, teaching education policy role models, and he started the Harlem Children's Zone, which some of you may be familiar with. Basically, he's adopted 99 blocks in Harlem, and he's built this pipeline, metaphorically, from cradle to college. So anything the richest families in New York get, he's invested in these 99 blocks. So it's uh, early childhood development, it's parenting classes, it's uh, fourth and fifth, five-year-olds get world-class education, they have the best teachers, they create their own schools, they have summer programs, they have art, they have sports, they have a nutritionist who works in their uh, nutrition school lunch, there it is. Uh, they have all these phenomenal programs, and they've absolutely proven that any student can achieve if it's expected of them. That any student, regardless of race, background, zip code, doesn't have to be locked in by their background and where they come from, their lives can be changed. We have to change the way we speak and think about it. Jeffrey Canada says, not much has changed in education for 50 years. If you look at lots of policy or other industries and that kind of thing, lots of things have changed in 50 years. But the biggest innovation in education has been standardized testing. We got to do better. We're failing generation after generation and yet we come back to these schools 50 years later and see the exact same results. That's not just on those going in education, but it's on us as we talk about education, the inequities that exist, understand how race and gender play a role in this, and understand that you can change it too. So, 
I'm going to end with another picture of Dr. Fryer, because why not? Uh, I'll be eating some Starbucks soon. But I wanted to kind of throw this in the mix. So there's this research out of University of Chicago uh, that looked at teachers um, in the 25th percentile of quality based on lots of metrics that I don't understand, and in the 75th percent of quality. So the 25th percent, uh, percentile of teachers, the 75th percentile. The difference in those two teachers was a million dollars in classroom uh, income achieved over a lifespan. So a fourth grade teacher, that's in the 75th percentile of quality. So some of the best teachers compared to the 25th percentile, uh, so a, a lower than average teacher, adds a million dollars to their students' potential earnings every single year. Now you're saying to yourself, why aren't teachers paid a million dollars a year? Exactly, totally agree. <laughs> I was a little selfish. <laughs> but in reality, that's how teachers should be perceived. Not just as changing lives in a fluffy kind of way, not just as taking care of kids, not doing it to get the MRS, not doing it because they can actually add real tangible value to the society. Yes, inequities exist, but they can be changed. It's not just on the teacher that needs to be a system that exists to empower them, but so much is on the teacher, we must change the way we talk about them. So, that crazy kid that was super bored is now super excited. We can't be bored in the way we look at schools. Our teachers is a dynamic part of our community and it's the foundation of who we are. Think back to the teachers that inspired you. Take time to tweet about it using the hashtag Tide Talks. Let me know the best teacher you've had and a word that describes them. And I might tweet for the first time as well. Thank you all very much.